Thanks, John. So uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. The reason we wanted to put together this conference is there's a lot of amazing new developments in advanced manufacturing technology. And they're starting to come together into this thing that I guess we're calling the digital factory. And uh, you know we've seen some examples of each one of these pieces. Uh, some of them are already presented. You'll hear more about them. But none of it, it's not been completely strung together yet into a fully digital factory. So I'm going to talk about some of the obstacles and, and some possible solutions. Uh, and I'll talk about the part I know best, which is 3D printing. So we have, a, we have a few new, I think, pretty interesting announcements to make. Um, but first, I'm going to do my sort of typical fact-based, probably overly dry setup for that. Um, but we'll get to the exciting part in a minute. Uh, so, so yeah, if we're going to talk about 3D printing in manufacturing, we should put it in perspective. Uh, there's humans manufacture across a huge range of scales from one to billions, and there's important things made all along the way. Uh, some very high value things on the, you know, on the lower volume end of the spectrum. And then, of course, the mass production that we, we think of, consumer electronics or consumer goods that are really high volume. Uh, and thus far, most of the examples you've heard about for 3D printing and manufacturing have really still been in this kind of thousands range. So the, probably the best example that's got a lot of press is this GE engine nozzle. It's great, takes advantage of 3D printing, and uh, you know, offers performance benefits. Definitely something we should see more of. Uh, but are there any examples on the other end of the spectrum? Is, is there any really high volume, million scale 3D printing? Turns out there's at least one good example. This is a uh, dental aligner, uh, which is an uh, orthodontic device that moves your teeth around and fixes them. And this is made in tens of millions per year. Uh, and uh, so it can only be done with 3D printing, or best done with 3D printing, because every one of them is vacuum formed on a 3D printed pattern. And uh, as a result, Millions of people around the world now have improved smiles thanks to 3D printing. So that's a, that's a pretty interesting result. Um, but actually, that, that example is, is almost an exception um, to that there's, there's really nothing else reaching tens of millions. And so it's kind of a standout. So is that it? Is that just one exception? Or are we going to see more of that? Uh, we think we will. And there's two big areas of improvements that are going to drive that. So one is materials, uh, because the range of materials available in 3D printing is still uh, greatly reduced from what's available in injection molding or other production methods. And ultimately, you need the material to do the job. Um, so you just heard from Edith Harmon at New Balance about uh, the uh, cleats project that we're working on with them. And this is really, really cool for us because uh, um, as you heard about all these benefits, the faster time to market, this is an industry that really needs uh, uh, customization uh, to be quick to market with different styles. And then actually the part I'm most excited about would be performance benefits uh, to be able to match the style of, of an athlete. Uh, and the hard, the, the really the missing piece here was a material that could stand up to the rigors of being on the bottom of, a, of an athlete's shoe. Uh, uh, the, the plate of the cleat has to be both pretty stiff and strong, but quite uh, high elongation and good wear properties. And so it was actually a material development that enabled this application. Uh, another great example uh, is uh, dentures. So a lot of interesting things happening with 3D printing and dental. Um, but so far, there are few, if any, applications where the 3D printed part is actually in your mouth for a long period of time. And that's because your mouth is a difficult environment. It's at elevated temperature. The part has to uh, be in contact with water. And then most importantly, it has to have a really high level of biocompatibility uh, and has to pass FDA and ISO certifications to, to do that. So it's, once again, actually a new uh, material development that allowed us to, to bring this application to the market and, uh, and obviously has great potential to, to impact a lot of lives. 
So the other area that uh, I talked about is the dropping cost per part. In contrast to materials, with materials, almost every application requires some kind of tweaked or improved material to, to drive that application. But if we can drop the per part cost in 3D printing, we can impact every one of these applications and help drive them forward. So uh, a great example to look at there is, uh, uh, so let's start with hearing aids. So hearing aids are probably like the next best example after the aligners of 3D printed uh, mass production. They're made in hundreds of thousands per year with 3D printing, maybe millions. And they have the benefit uh, of uh, everyone's ear is different. And so if you, want, if you want something sitting in your ear all day long and you want it to fit well and be comfortable and not fall out, it needs to be custom to your ear. So. Uh, companies like Starkey have, uh, have commercialized this, and there's millions of people in the world who have these 3D printed hearing aids. It's great. But uh, we, we all actually, fortunately not everyone needs a hearing aid, but almost everyone uses something very similar, earbuds. And I think most people have dealt with this problem where earbud either doesn't fit and falls out, or it's too big and it's not comfortable. So why can't we all walk into a Bose store and get a $100 pair of custom fit earbuds. Um, and it's especially a good question because the hearing aids, they, they've been around for a few years now, and it's exactly the same process and technology that's needed. So they, it ultimately comes down to the cost. Those hearing aids cost thousands of dollars, and there's just not a viable market for a mass consumer product at that price point. So this is a great example of uh, and there's a number of startups working on this now that if we can just get that cost to a low enough level, we'll enable a huge range of uh, mass customized earbuds. So if we want to talk about uh, how technology can drive down costs in manufacturing, there's kind of one amazing example that, uh, that, that's the, the really important to study, which is Moore's Law. Uh, so. What Moore's Law said, or this, this variant of Moore's Law, is that uh, the cost per transistor would drop steadily and quickly over time. And it has over several decades, and it continues. And that's interesting in its own right, because there's not too many places in manufacturing where you can expect significant cost improvements every year. I'm sure everyone would like that, but it doesn't usually happen. Uh, so that, that's interesting. But what was really important about that is it allowed us to put transistors or computing into more and more places. And so we went from mainframes at big companies to PCs in every office and eventually home. And now we all walk around with a supercomputer in our pockets and we have all the benefits that come from that. And so I think there's a really similar thing happening in 3D printing where the cost per part is dropping uh, every year, maybe not quite as dramatically as with the transistor, but it's continuing to, to fall. And as that happens, we, op we push 3D printing to new places, just like the transistor went into new places. So 3D printing, first application that was really successful was prototyping, and that's because a prototype is worth a lot. You can justify higher costs. Uh, and over time, as the cost of 3D printing dropped, it went into more and more places. And uh, so I think today we can kind of think about a sort of cost per part threshold, which is the best cost we can achieve with 3D printing. And that limits the applications that sort of exist today. Um, but if we can keep bringing that down, we're going to open up more and more applications and drive all the benefits of 3D printing out into the world. OK, so you know, as a 3D printing company, this is, this is how we see it, and uh, we think that this is, if there's one thing we need to focus on, it's, it's ultimately this. This is the biggest way we can make 3D printing impactful in the world. To do that, we need to kind of break down cost per part. And here's how we look at it. Uh, there's three main categories. There's the cost of owning the equipment, the cost of materials that go into the part, and the cost of the labor. Um, most of you, there has been a lot of excitement recently about uh, driving down the cost per part, but almost all of it has been on the equipment side. And you heard a lot of companies talking about speed, very fast printers, or very high productivity printers. 
Uh, but equally important to speed, uh, to, to calculate the amortized cost of equipment, is the cost of the equipment. And uh, in our case, with Formlabs, we've already driven the equipment cost so low, we're at a tenth or a hundredth the cost of similar systems, that this portion of the equation turns out to be nearly zero for most applications anyway. So it's not that interesting, actually. Uh, the other two parts, though, materials and labor, they, they are important. Materials, uh, absolutely, as, a, as an industry, we need to uh, continue to, to push that down. 3D printed materials are still well above the cost of injection molded or other materials. So that's an important area of work. Um, but when we ask people who operate, companies who operate high 3D printing at very high volume, the biggest service bureaus, and ask them how their costs break down, add it all up, it turns out that labor is almost always the largest category. And this is a little counterintuitive, um, because for people who haven't used a 3D printer, uh, you imagine a 3D printer as this box that just spits out a finished part with no human intervention. It's this magical you know, Star Trek replicator. Um, for those of you who have used a 3D printer, you know that's kind of far from the case. And in fact, it's one of the more labor-intensive ways you can actually make something often. Um, so there's labor in setting up a print, and then there's lit even more after it's done uh, finishing the part. So this is actually the biggest area of improvement, and, uh, and this is what uh, we want to focus on. So uh, just to kind of drive it home, if we go back to that one example of uh, parts being made at tens of millions per year, it's from a company called Align Technologies, and this is what their factory looks like. It's almost completely automated, and there's very little labor involved, and, and so they've, they've really managed to bring the cost down that way. So it's really cool to see that, and obviously a lot of good work went into it, but that's a room full of equipment, millions of dollars, years of engineering. Is that what it takes to, to automate every 3D printing process? That's what, that's what we asked ourselves. Is it possible to put a 3D printing production cell in a box? We think it is, and here's how. Formlabs created the world's best-selling 3D printer. Over 25,000 Form 2s are in the hands of professional CAD users across the globe, changing how things are made. 3D printing is already part of the production process across a number of industries, but for 3D printed parts to reach more people, it's still too expensive. Introducing FormCell, automated 3D print production powered by the Form 2. FormCell will significantly lower cost per part and make mass customization a reality. One click print and preform will take you from a 3D design file to a ready to use final part that has been automatically printed, washed, and cured. All of this helps eliminate the most repetitive parts of the process, reducing the cost per part and letting you spend more time creating value for your customers. Form Cell, putting the means of production back in your hands. Thanks. So we're really excited to bring FormCell into the world. And uh, now I'm going to ask David Lakatosh, uh, FormLab's Chief Product Officer, to come and tell you more about it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here today and tell you about FormLab's uh, automated 3D printing solution for mass production. This is what we imagine uh, will take us to the place where we can really impact not just hundreds of thousands of people, but really millions, hundreds of millions, or even above. What you see here is the form cell. It's a f this is the configuration with five printers in it and the post-processing solution. If you look a little bit closer, you will see a familiar face. This is the form two. And at this point, you probably ask yourself, why is Formlabs here? Why, why are we putting on this conference? What are we actually known for? We are known for creating accessible desktop 3D printers, not manufacturing solutions, right? 
but we really think that we are the people who are going to uh, take this technology and this industry to the next level. Why? First of all, we created already the 3D printer that is uh, manufactured at the highest volume. We sold over 25,000 professional 3D printers to date. And these printers, they created 10 million parts. And that's, that's what really convinced us that we have something special here. What <coughs> further, what we think is, is we are, it's being replicated is very similar to how computing evolved. If you ask somebody in the 60s, what type of architecture is going to be enabling you to create bigger uh, computational solve bigger computational problems and go further? They will say we'll probably get to bigger and bigger uh, servers that are going to perform better, and their performance is going to eclipse almost anything out there. But we all know that that's not what happened. What happened is distributed computing, modular systems that were able to create a better performance and they were able to scale to whatever production need you needed, those are the ones that are powering the internet today. If you look at Amazon, if you look at Google, if you look at Facebook, they're all driven by distributed computers. And we really think that this is exactly what's going to happen here as well. Today, the form cell is costs as much as an industrial 3D printer and it comes with a lot of extra bells and whistles. It is able to scale up to your, your, your needs. You're able to deploy multiple cells next to each other to match whatever capacity you need. Uh, and it's more fault to tolerant just by the way it's designed. It's parallel instead of just being monolithic. So let's dive a little bit deeper. What is the form cell? Form cell, as you saw, there are a bunch of form twos. That's great. What is this thing? The dirty secret in 3D printing is post-processing. If you ever use a 3D printer, you know the unfortunate reality. You print something, but that, that print is not yet ready for assembly. It's not re yet ready for your final customer. So what, what, needs, what needs to happen between a, a final print and a final part? It needs to be post-processed. In our technology, uh, this means washing and UV curing in order to reach its final peak performance. This is all integrated into one system, so the operator doesn't need to uh, handle the individual systems. And of course, automation. We've, uh, Darren already talked about this, and, and, and a few people will be today. Uh, automation is really what drives down the labor portion of the equation. Uh, an industrial gantry moves uh, the system from one place to the other. It starts from uh, an empty build platform, to the printing part, to post-processing, all one continuous system, no operator interruption needed. And when the parts are ready, they end up on a cart, so you can put it into the next stage of your manufacturing process seamlessly. But hardware is not the only place where we innovate. We've worked a lot on the software part of the, of the system. At the end of the day, when we talk about the future of manufacturing in a repetitive, we think about lights out manufacturing as, as one concept that a lot of people have talked about. It really thinks about how can we really walk away from our manufacturing equipment, go home, come back, and the next day th the production line continues to operate and we can start up where we left off. This today is, is not a reality. But we think with treating the system as a black box, where you really just supply information in the, in, with, with 3D printable files, you can get to a place where you just get the final parts uh, without actually thinking about which printer is doing what job. An automatic uh, scheduler, uh, not, not, not unlike AWS uh, load balancing servers, we're choosing intelligently which printer should do which job in order to meet, meet the deadline um, and the performance needed. But 3D printing is not the only manufacturing solution that we need to talk about. If you look at any device today, reach into your pockets, look around, not any device is manufactured with one solution. There are a number of manufacturing solutions from injection molding to CNC machining to vacuum forming, working together in concert to create parts. And that's exactly how we think that the world is going to work. We're not here to replace factories. We're not here to replace entire manufacturing processes that have been built over many, many decades. We're here to upgrade them and to go one step further. 3D printing is going to be part of the manufacturing floor. That's what we're trying to prepare the world for. So 
uh, we are going to integrate with existing ERP and MES systems to make sure that this system is going to be ready for your manufacturing floor and you can start working with it. But enough about the system. Let's talk about how it will impact actually the world. Here's a great application from prosthetics. Uh, one of our customers called Lyman Connor, is actually here somewhere in, in the rows, has, who's a GE engineer, uh, has been thinking about prosthetics uh, because of frustration. Prosthetics today are very, very expensive, and maybe even worse, they really only come in small, medium, and large sizes. And that's extremely bad uh, for, for the patient who's trying to really just continue with their lives, but they're, they're not necessarily able to because technology gets into their way. So he has been working with uh, engineers and figuring out how he can create a customized prosthetic solution that scales. So this is how one of his prints looks like. This is the knuckle portion of, of a prosthetic. Let's dive into the numbers. Going back to the equation that Max has already touched upon, there are three parts of the system, equipment ownership cost, materials, and labor. These three together drive the total cost per part. So what ends up happening today, um, he uses a number of uh, Form 2s in concert, and our estimation is that he gets to roughly about a $50 per part for a hand. This is 16 different 3D printed parts with all of the post-processing, everything done manually. How does this compare to a form cell like automation? Boom, 41% uh, deduction in cost. Where is this actually coming from? It comes from two places. The more obvious part is the labor. The labor side, we've decreased, obviously, a lot of operator time because we're able to go from, um, we can able to go from a completely automated, from a, to a completely automated system instead of a sequential uh, steps all performed by an operator. But very surprisingly, there's deduction even on the equipment ownership part. Why is that? Surprisingly, uh, it's, it's utilization. You're able to get to 90, 95% utilization when you're actually automating the cell because you're continually able to use the printers and nobody needs to be there at 2 a.m. To, to change a print. When you're doing a manual uh, setup, you are usually only can get to about 30%. So that's where a lot of the cost saving is co coming from. So we're really excited. We're really excited to work on the threshold that, that Max has already described and keep on lowering it. By working continuously on all parts of the system, hardware, software, integration, we think that we can make a steady progress. And for me, Moore's Law actually has a slightly different meaning. Moore's Law is about predicting the ability to predict the future. If you understand how cost per part will go down over time, you will be able to understand what industries and applications will be impacted next. And we can start today working with those industries. So I'm really, really excited to work with the customers and the applications in the coming years and months. Um, and with that, I'm going to end. Thank you very much for your attention. I want to go back to where we started Forum Labs. We started with this thought that our ideas almost always exceed our capability to make them. And we're always limited by the tools we have. And that's why we set out to build a professional, easy to use 3D printer. And, uh, and that, that was the Form 1. And so I, at, uh, when we launched the Form 1, we were fortunate enough to get John Hirschtick, founder of SolidWorks Nonshape, to kind of summarize what we were trying to do in his own words. He's actually in the conference here somewhere. Uh, and the way, the way he put it is, we're trying to make a giant step closer to the engineer's dream, which is routine 3D printing, the way they print on paper. And, you know, we, fast forward a few years, I think we've done that. We've shipped more professional, we're shipping more professional 3D printers than all other companies combined. And that, that's something I'm proud of. But what I think is even more important, the part I'm really proud of, is that there's something like 100,000 people in the world who get to feel that amazing feeling when they take an idea, make it real, and get to hold it in their own hands. So today, we're going to bring another tool that does the same thing.
original means of creation. With them, we touched the world and shaped it. We made tools. Tools built machines. Machines created industry. Industry demanded trade. We evolved, found new ways to make, to build, to change the world. But things got out of hand. It's time to make a change, to produce only what we need, to make products where they are designed, to create things by people, for people. It's time we bring back the human touch and get our hands dirty again. Introducing the Formlabs Fuse One, putting the means of production back in your hands. Thank you. So that's the Fuse One. It uses selective laser sintering technology. SLS is the process that makes the best end use parts with excellent material properties. The problem is it's been unavailable to most people because the extreme cost and difficulty of using these machines. So today we're doing it again and bringing SLS technology to a huge number of designers and engineers. Now, I want to introduce Eduardo Torrealba, who's been leading the team and building the Fuse One since the beginning, to tell you more about it. Thanks, Max. It is so good to be here with all of you today. I have been looking forward to this moment for a very long time. Uh, when I first joined Formlabs a few years ago, uh, I heard that we were thinking about building an SLS printer, and I have to admit I was a little bit intimidated by that proposition. Uh, I knew this was something that was far more complicated than what I'd be able to do by myself, but there was something else that Formlabs was building uh, at the same time that gave me a lot of hope for creating this product, and that thing is the Form 2. You see, with the Form 2, we didn't just build a desktop stereolithography 3D printer. We built an engineering uh, toolkit that would serve as the foundation for lots of other products. We've already seen the Form Cell, and now we're looking at another product that we're building on top of the Form 2. With the Form 2, we created things like custom galvanometers to steer lasers, electronics to control motors, heaters, and lots of other parts of the printer, as well as a suite of software that's embedded on the printer that makes all this work together. So let's dive into the, the Fuse 1 and see what we've built with this toolkit. The Fuse 1, like Max said, uses selective laser centering, which is a powder bed fusion 3D printing technology. And if used one, particles of nylon are dispensed on a surface and they're swept into a thin layer. That layer is then brought up to right below the melting temperature of those particles. And once they're at temperature, a laser strikes the surface and fuses those particles together, creating a slice of a 3D printed part. This process is repeated over and over again until you have a complete part. And the parts that are printed on the Fuse One are just as strong as the expensive uh, parts that are created on much more expensive machines. And these parts, uh, they really hold up to wear and tear. Uh, if you've ever dropped uh, a 3D printed part, you know how scary it can be to, uh, to drop your parts on the floor. But parts printed with SLS are strong enough uh, that this really isn't a problem. And the reason that SLS parts are so strong is because they're printed out of nylon. Nylon is a widely used engineering material. We actually make more than five and a half million tons of nylon every year as a species. Uh, it's used in everything from bushings and bearings to athletic equipment, medical devices, and lots of consumer products. You probably have a lot of parts made out of nylon in your home or in your factory right now, and you might not even be aware of it. Now that we have a nylon printer at the office, uh, we've been able to tackle a lot of interesting products that would have been more difficult in the past. One of these projects uh, is this bike pedal. This was designed by Luke Plummer, one of the mechanical engineers on the project. And he's actually been riding this bike pedal to and from the office every day, something like 10 miles round trip. Uh, and it's held up great to the stresses and strains of uh, a round trip uh, bike journey here in Boston. Another great thing about SLS printing is that all the particles that are unfused actually support the parts that are being produced. Uh, and this means that you can print really intricate and complicated structures. It gives designers the freedom to have things like undercuts, uh, overhangs, and really small features that would be difficult, if not impossible, with uh, other traditional 3D printing processes. 
The team at Nervous Systems created this really amazing uh, chainmail pattern. But with SLS, you don't have to just print a sheet of material. You can actually print something pretty complicated like this shirt. Uh, this is a 3D printed shirt. It has, I think, 11,311 individual links. And that was just as easy to print as any single part. Uh, they designed the shirt in their own software, and then they folded it up to fit into the Fuse One's build volume. And the end result can be seen uh, outside, and I hope you'll take a chance uh, to look at it after the session. So we can see that SLS printing is a really powerful production process, uh, but let's take a minute and find out what makes the Fuse One so easy to use. The way we make things is changing. Engineers and designers rely on selective laser sintering, or SLS, when other materials won't do, when they need the parts to be strong, impact resistant, and stable over time. SLS fuses nylon powder layer by layer. The powder supports the parts, allowing for complex interconnecting designs. Introducing the Fuse One, bringing the industrial power of SLS to the benchtop. With no need for supports, multiple models can be tightly packed into your build. You can also add parts to an active build so that you can iterate faster than ever before. A live video feed lets you monitor progress and performs real-time inspection for better part quality. The Fuse One is a workhorse. Minimize turnaround time by swapping out the entire build chamber when your print has finished, allowing you to immediately start the next print. Fuse One, putting the means of production in your hands. We've worked really hard over the past few years to really simplify the SLS process and make it much easier to use. Uh, the way that we did this was by really shrinking down the process to its bare essentials and stripping back all the things that are not needed. So you no longer need high-powered electricity, inert gases, or dedicated rooms to run printers in. Uh, we've, we've taken the printer and, and made it something you can put on your workbench. Another big thing that we did uh, is incorporate all the different features and multiple different software packages into Preform so that you can easily pack your build volume with parts. Uh, we've included 3D packing uh, algorithms into Preform that mean that you can pack an entire build volume with lots of parts. And since we're here at the digital factory and we're thinking about production, uh, it's pretty obvious to think that once you can pack a build volume full of these high quality nylon parts, you can start thinking about production in a different way. And at Formlabs, one way that we're doing this is actually with the FormCure. Uh, the FormCure is a hardware product that we released recently that helps complete the SLA experience uh, by post-processing parts that come out of the Form 2. When we were prototyping this machine, uh, we started looking at some of the different parts in the machine, and uh, we found one that we think could make a great uh, example for SLS production. This is a small coupling, and it's used to attach a turntable that sits in the form cure to a stepper motor. And this coupling, we can actually fit more than 400 of them in the build volume of the Fuse One. And uh, just like Max and David talked about with per part costs, uh, if you take into account things like the amortization of the machine and the labor costs associated with cleaning these parts up, uh, you actually find out that you can produce quite a few of these uh, for a really low cost. Uh, in fact, we can make more than 11,000 of these units uh, before it would make sense to manufacture them through a traditional process. Uh, and this is significantly more units than you can do if you were to uh, shop these parts out to a traditional service bureau. So the Fuse One is really making us rethink the way that we approach prototyping and production. And we're not the only company that's doing that. Uh, companies like Google, Steelcase, and DECA have been testing the Fuse One. And even though I can't share everything that they're doing uh, with you today, there's some really amazing things coming, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to having a chance to see what uh, those companies come up with. So in summary, the Fuse One is a high-quality, uh, industrial-powered SLS printer that sits on your benchtop. Now, traditionally, SLS printers cost somewhere between $200,000 and a million dollars. But today, we are proud to announce that the Fuse One will be available for less than $10,000. You can reserve a Fuse One today. This guarantees your place in line as we begin production, and we'll start shipping beta units uh, to customers later this year. 
I'm so excited to see what everyone in this room and people around the world do with the Fuse One and SLS printing as they get their hands on the machine. Now I'd like to invite Max back up to close this out. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, so we have both of these machines, the Forum Cell and the Fuse One, actually on the demo floor. Those are the things that were covered up. So you can go take a look at them after we uh, wrap up this session. Uh, and uh, I want to, uh, and they're both running. That's important. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I want to take a minute to thank everyone who has been working really hard for the last few months. On, on Fuse One, on Forum Cell, and on putting this conference together. So, thank you. <laughs> so, I, I want to leave everyone with a thought, or actually, sort of a challenge, which is uh, that um, roughly on the order of 10 million people have been directly impacted by 3D printing today. And that's a decent result. Uh, but there's a lot more people in the world. I think that with the combined efforts of everyone in this room, and it's going to take the design software, you know, the ERP, MES uh, software, IoT systems, and lots more 3D printing systems manufacturers as well, I think we can take that number to a billion in the next five years. So let's do it. Thank you.